Uh, our next speaker actually needs no introduction, absolutely none. She is absolutely one of my personal sheroes on earth. And if I could be like anybody, you know, I would be like her. So in the interest of time, certainly, I really want to give her a props. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nina Turner. Besides being a beautiful black woman, and I hope all women kind of love that. <laughs> Nina knows what it means to work hard. Born, to the, el born the eldest of seven children in Cleveland, Ohio, Nina accepted her first job at age 14 to help support her family and siblings. Nina's work, ethically empathetic and commitment to serving others stem largely from her humble beginnings in Cleveland. She is the oldest of seven children, not just one of. You know, she's the oldest of. So when you're the oldest and you got that many brothers and sisters, you're like the co-parent as well of those children. So what I wanted to tell you is that Nina is always the person that one would go to if you want to know what it is to really be passionate about the work that you do and what you believe in and the fact that you believe in your heart, that if you stand up and speak out, you can truly make a difference. Miss Nina. It would drive her crazy to stand here, so I'm not going to insist on it. But she likes to move around, so, you know, do you, I know, I've seen you, girl. Yes. <laughs> well, in other places. Thank you. So do your thing. thing. Thank you, Madam Vice President, very, very much. And I want to thank Mark as well and all of you who are here tonight. It's been a long night, so I'm going to try to cut some of my remarks short. I'm not making any promises, though. <laughs> I just, for all of our labor sisters and brothers who are standing don't destroy good jobs and to hear them tell their stories we can overlay what they had to say tonight on so many of our sisters and brothers all across this country i don't know about you but i'm just sick and tired of politicians whispering sweet nothings in our ear i want them to get some ovaries or some balls one of the two but let's get something love you guys uh, Michael told me I need to give a shout out to Local 6, the hotel workers. Thank you so much for everything that you do to make us comfortable. Man, and what would tonight be like if I didn't give a shout out to the baddest sisters on the planet, the nurses? And we got some brother nurses too, but I'm just talking about the sisters in the house. Ain't nothing like a sister in the house. Now, you know Madam VP Wade, you know they made Lady Liberty finally is a sister now. With, with a brain, you know, she fierce. That's how it originally was, but you know, anyway, that's another story. And I gotta give a shout out to a candidate who is a progressive, who stands up, who really lost a lot in New Jersey because he stood up for what was right. He stood up for the man in the race that had the heart-soul agreement by the name of Bernard Sanders. He stood up for him. And he is running for governor in New Jersey. He and hopefully we will be able to call her first lady, but I want to give a shout out to John Wisnowski in the house and Mrs. Wisnowski. You know, it takes a lot to run for office. We need some more progressives running for office. Now I tell you this, I, 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 didn't, I don't like everything that the Tea Party necessarily stands for. They're on the opposite side of the scale from, uh, from some of the, those of us on the left. But I will tell you what the Tea Party did do. They put establishment Republicans on notice. So we need Tea Party left to put establishment Democrats on notice. They on borrowed time. I'm just a little disturbed. I don't know 
know about you, and this is not in my notes, but I'm just feeling some type of way about the fact back there were the 13 Democrats that voted against. I'm just saying, I don't know if we're gonna blame that on President-elect Trump or the Russians, but I'm just saying. They voted against that on their own. And it makes no sense to me that we have people who have so much privilege by virtue of their office, and they won't even stand up for the people, and they come up with all kinds of excuses. <laughs> Russia didn't do that. And President-elect Trump didn't do that. They did that on their own. All I'm saying, sisters and brothers, and I just, I wouldn't go down this road, but I'm just going down this road today. I don't want you, see, for the advocates and activists in this room, my opening speech is for you, because you're gonna have workshops all tomorrow, and you're going out by the bull. And I don't want you to forget what this sign says right here. It says single pair strategy conference. It doesn't say single pair get comfortable conference. <laughs> you have to strategize. We have to organize, organize, organize. And when we're done organizing, let's organize some more. And after that, organize, organize, organize. Yeah. That's what this is about. And the cause of social justice and economic justice and political justice is right, and the undergirding of those justices is health care, single payer, health care for all. And I, I'm just, I don't get how in the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth, I can't get because 58% of Americans, whether they Republican or Democrat, no party, high party, low party, just want to party, 58% of Americans believe that we should have single-payer health care. And I know that everybody in this room, hopefully everybody in this room is not a Democrat because I think we should be omnipartisan on this issue. This is not a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or a Green Party issue. This is omnipartisan issue. However, though, for my Democratic sisters and brothers, you know, I was at the platform meeting. <laughs> I'm just saying, because I'm feeling some type of way. And I, I, maybe the Russians did that too. <laughs> but Democrats didn't even have the courage to put single pair in the platform. <laughs> so all I'm saying, sisters and brothers, I, I know we get caught up on the fact that a man who lives in New York down the way, round the corner, down the block, round the way, won the, ele won the electoral college and is going to be sworn in. But I don't want you to get caught up in that. There's promise in the promise. I don't want you to get caught up in that because to the extent that you get so caught up in that, then we lose sight on what we are supposed to be fighting for. Because you're putting all your emotion in the fact the man is going to be sworn in. Let's just make this plain. President-elect Trump is going to be sworn into office. He is. So now our job. How many of you are familiar with the cartoon Pinky and the Brain? They don't air it anymore. But <laughs> Pinky, Pinky and Brain, they said, what we're going to do tonight is what we do every night. We try to take over the world. <laughs> right? So it doesn't much matter that he's there. What are we going to do? We're going to do what we do every night. We're going to try to make a single payer Medicare for all world, starting with the United States of America that's behind a lot of other countries. The reason why I don't want you to get caught up in that, and I'm not saying we, we, we probably will have to fight President Trump, let Trump on a whole bunch of stuff. And looking at that cabinet he done put together, we're going to have to fight him on a whole bunch of stuff. But if you get caught up in he's the racist and his cabinet is the racist and we see racists everywhere and everybody who voted for him is a racist, we lose our ability to be able to have conversation one to another with our sisters and brothers who were crying out and establishment Democrats refuse to listen to the people, which is why we are in this situation right now, today. I'm just saying. And it doesn't much matter that Democrats won the popular vote. It doesn't matter.
that's not the rules of the game. It's whoever gets the most electoral college votes. And guess what, Democrats? We lost. In the memory of their daughter, they are fighting a battle not just for her, but for our children and children yet unborn in this country for the importance that health care access, good, robust health care access. Now, you know, for them to bury their daughter is out of the natural order of things. Because no parent should ever, ever, ever have to bury their child. Their child should bury them. And I want, them, I want us to give them a, a, a hand clap of praise for the sacrifice and for being here tonight. about the stories that Healthcare Now has on their website, telling the stories of everyday Americans who are trying their best every single day to make it. And not having access to healthcare should not be what, what separates you from living a good life. It shouldn't cause you bankruptcy. It shouldn't cause you heartache. And it shouldn't cause you death. But that is what is happening in the United States of America. And all we get from folks, not all folks, because there are some noble folks in the elected ministry, but there are some folks in this ministry who will not sacrifice for something that is bigger than themselves. And how can we live in the greatest country on the face of the earth and let 22-year-olds die? How can we do that? It is a stain. It is immoral. It is unconscionable. Every 
single American to have access to high quality health care, <laughs> Medicare for all. We're not going to accept anything less. So I thank God for folks like you. And I know everybody has a story to tell. I don't know how many of you have ever been to black church. Baptist, Pentecostal, y'all been to black church? There's nothing like it. You got to go. <laughs> Put that on the bucket list. <laughs> I bring that up because testimony, some churches have testimony, where people can tell their story so that you can be motivated, but also so you can know that some folks, that you are in the same situation. It is because of people like you in this room that we can continue to fight this fight. Because the mission is so high, we can't get over it. And the mission is so low, we can't get under it. And the mission is so wide, we can't get around it. And I don't want you to get weary in well-doing because people are going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, you're delusional, you're crazy, folks will never let it be done. We're going to walk some folks down. That's what we're going to do. And it might take the next generation to get it done, but you are priming the pump for the next generation. Can I share something with you? In my high school days, not many years ago, <laughs> I think a sister still got it. I don't know about you. But I used to run track, and I was the first leg of the 440 relay. That means a sister had some speed, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the reason why the 440 relay is so important, I want you to have this fixated in your mind for every workshop that you go to tomorrow, for every caucus that you join, for every time that you are feeling weary in your well-doing. The 440 relay we run as a team, and the first leg of the race sets the pace, and the goal is to get distance between you and the team that you are running against so that you set up the next leg of the race who gets more distance and the next leg of the race who gets more distance and the next leg of the race. That is what this fight is about. This is about us setting the 440 relay generation after generation after generation. We're going to walk some folks down before they know it. We're going to be at the finish line, baby. Don't worry about those naysayers. There's always going to be folks talking about what can't be done, what shouldn't be done. Hell, it was one point in time in this country said black folks wouldn't be free. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Thank Jesus we are. Mm. Anyway, that's another lecture. <laughs> there were some folks who said women weren't going to never get the right to vote. Holla back, sisters. Holla back. We got it. Now, we do want our whole damn dollar. We're still working on that, right, sisters? We want our whole damn dollar. How many sisters want their whole damn dollar? We don't want 77 cents, 65 cents, 52 cents. We want the whole dollar. That's another lecture for another day. So I thank God for all of you promising the problem. So 49 years, Dr. King, I got to go into my purse. I'm going to pull something out. Because, see, something dangerous is happening not just about the election of somebody that black people in this room didn't necessarily want to see elected. But we can't let hate consume us. Dr. King warned us of that. And it's really in vogue, it's really cute for us to wax poetic about Dr. King and how great he was and what he did. What we forget in that history lesson is that when Dr. King was doing the daggone thing, there were a whole bunch of folks against him, saying what he couldn't do, and to slow down, brother, and what you're doing, what you're doing, you're going too fast. You had even Christian folks, ministers saying the same thing. You even had some black folks saying the same thing. See, people are going to tell the story differently now in the same way that everybody wants to claim to be a progressive now. Cause it's, but, but, but that's OK. I, I, I'm, anyway, y'all bring me back for that one. So let me just say this. Dr. King said on resisting hatred, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. 
We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to denigrate into physical violence again and again. We must rise to the majestic heights of the, me of the meeting, phys of meeting physical force with soul force. Brothers, I, I, I want to end my, my talk tonight to talk to you about soul force. We must meet physical force with soul force. What that means is that we don't talk about folks who don't necessarily agree with us. We don't talk about their mama and talk about them and, and talk about how stupid they are and that they dwell in basements and anyway. <laughs> that they part of the 47% that are takers. In order for us to win this fight, we have to reason one with another. And what that means is that we may disagree, but I don't have to tear you down, you down to disagree. Separate feeling from function. Be hard on the issue, soft on people. Hard on the issue, soft on people. Hard on the issue, soft on people. Now we, and I'm not talking about the folks in this room, I'm talking about the people who are not in this room. Because I know folks on this room don't go on social media talking about folks' mama and their kids and their daddy and their cat. I know y'all don't do that in here. But I'm talking about the other people. And I know the folks in here don't think that they are better than anybody else, that they are more enlightened than anybody else. I know not the people in here, but other folks. What I'm saying, sisters and brothers, soul force means that you seek first. Stephen Covey once said that seek first to understand and then to be understood. We got to reason one to another and agree to disagree, but we don't have to tear each other down to do it. And what I fear is happening, that some people in the political space, they benefit from the confusion that is happening and the turmoil that is happening and their plan on our emotion about the election of President Trump. And I'm gonna give him his props. Because that's the way I was raised. You respect the office. Flint water crisis ain't because of the Russians and President-elect Trump, that's all I'm saying. The fact that they're still drinking out of bottled water today. The fact that so many of our children, Chicago is not the world. The violence in Chicago. All I'm saying, I want you to imagine having to raise your children in communities where you are afraid to walk the street. Yet we're going to continue to point our finger at one. Are we going to let one person control our minds and our destiny and where we go as a people, as a nation? We have never done that. And we have always met any challenge with resistance. And there's a righteous resistance. We can do this. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to be mad as hell and frustrated and thinking you woke up in the twilight zone, this is real, baby, I'm here to tell you, we are all the way down in the rabbit hole, ain't no doubt about it. But we can overcome this, because we are the United States of America. We are a nation of progress. We are not a perfect nation, but generation after generation after generation, we have been a nation of progress. And there is nothing different today than it was yesterday, than it was a year ago, than it was two years ago, than what happened in 2008, that what happened in 2009. We are still that same nation. So the leap might be a little, or the climb might be a little higher. We might have to run a little longer. But you wanted this in 2008, did you not? And when we had the opportunity, help me black Jesus, let me just say this. <laughs> we had an opportunity, sister, to have single payer. We had it. When Democrats controlled both the House and the Senate, Lord have mercy, we had the opportunity. Anyway, I'm going to leave the rest of the I just. 
I say that just because I want you guys, we, we have to be a thinking people too. Don't let other folks get us caught up in their drama. Now when it's time to fight the issues, let's fight the issues. But we need to take a page out of Senator Bernie Sanders' book where he says, never lose your sense of outrage, right? Never lose it. And number two, you see him traveling all over this country talking about what? The issues. We talking about the Russians. We talking about the issues. Now we gotta protect our nation. There's no doubt about it, from cyber warfare, no doubt about it. President Trump is obligated to stand up as the American president, not the co-signer in chief for Russia. However, we have so many challenges in this nation that have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with, with what happened in the 2016 election cycle, things that we need to fix, things that we need to take care of, and we need to do that. And we can do all of this at the same time. Hold folks accountable, protect ourselves. We need the private sector and the public sector to be engaged in fiercely defending us from cyber warfare. Look what happened to Sony. You guys remember when Sony's emails let me just say this, Sister Brothers Memo. Don't put nothing in email that you won't, don't want on the front page of the paper. That's all I'm saying. Don't talk about folks in the email. Call them up. Go old fashioned and talk about them. But don't do it in the email. That's the lesson. Don't, just don't do it in the email. <laughs> Call them. Don't leave no fingerprints. Call them up, cuss them out. Don't leave voicemails, don't text. Just, just call them. Yeah, go, just call them, go to the house, do old fashioned. Message it, note in the bottle, just call them, face to face. So, but we have challenges of social inequality, political inequality, economic inequality. We have two parties that sometimes we can't tell the difference between the two. Okay. But you are the reason. And here on a Friday night, getting ready to fight the fight, to continue your fight for single-payer health care because it is the right thing to do. And generations from now, when your story is told about who had the perseverance enough, because this is a long-distance race. I never forget when I was frustrated in 2014, I was running for Secretary of State in the great state of Ohio, and all of my Republican colleagues were messing with access to the ballot box. You know what, Sister Brooke, can I just tell you, almost 50% of registered eligible voters didn't even vote in 2016. Do y'all hear me? People have opted out. People are making rational decisions. They're making rational decisions that may seem illogical to us, but they're making rational decisions because you have people running for office who are not motivating people to get out there and to support them because you know what they say, I'm gonna vote for you for what? Because all I'm going to get is more of the same. And so we need a paradigm shift in this country. That people who run for elected office from dog catcher to president of the United States mean what you say, say what you mean, stand up for the people, care more about the next generation than you do about your next election. Those are the kinds of people we want elected to office. Tell the truth. So one of the minister who I adore from Cleveland, when I was frustrated, Dr. Otis Moss Jr. You know about him, he got the voice of God. He sounds like what God would sound like. And, and he said the following, he said, Senator, the struggle is forever. So we are forever in the struggle. And that's what I want you to know, this doesn't end. So we have to have that heart-soul agreement. We have to have that heart connection, even when things don't seem like they are going our way. There is promise in the problem. We will surmount this challenge. We will get to single payer. Do you think that when President FDR was fighting the New Deal, folks wasn't in love with that at the time? 
They thought Social Security was socialism. Come on, somebody. We need to understand our history in this country. We did it then, and we can do it now. And the change that we need to get single payer Medicare for all is not going to come from the grass tops. It is going to come from the grassroots. It is going to come from people like you in this room. Soul force is what it's going to take. I want to close this out with a personal story. Now, I hope you know politicians and preachers get four or five closings, but it's coming up on 10 o'clock, so I want to finish this thing out with you because I'm feeling full, not just because of David and Amy, but just even to be here with you tonight. Because being an activist, being a professional in the medical field, being an agitator for good, it's hard. And you're going to lose some friends. You're going to lose some folks along the way. You're going to lose some stuff along the way. But I guarantee you this, that will all be worth it. You are making a sacrifice. Because some people think we're extreme in this room. They think we done lost our ever-loving minds. And maybe we have for good. But you will never regret that you were on the front line to make sure that mamas and daddies and babies in this country have access to high quality health care. To make sure that not another one of our sisters and brothers have to file bankruptcy because they got a pre-existing condition. That Young folks, our millennial generation, can know that they won't be saddled with medical debt and college debt all at the same time. This is a moral call right here. This is not about politics. This is about morality. This is about who really is standing on the right side. We got enough money for all of this. Matter of fact, we save money. Is that right, Madam VP? We save a little money if we do this. So we save lives, lives, it's economically right and it's morally right. Can I just tell you a story? I, I, oldest of seven children, oldest of seven children. And my parents got married very young. That's why I take this single pair for all very personally. My, my parents got married young, they were teenagers and it didn't work out. And so I lived the majority of my life in a single mama household and I watched my mother struggle to try to raise seven children, to do the best that she could. She made mistakes along the way. Anybody, we're all human, we make mistakes. When I was a sophomore at a community college, Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland, I got home from school and there was a note on the refrigerator door directing me and my husband to go to the hospital because my mother was there. And sisters and brothers, I didn't think anything of it because my mother had a history of high blood pressure. I just thought it was going to be just, just a routine thing. Little did I know that that was going to be a defining moment in my life and the lives of my six other siblings. When I got to the hospital and I said to the nurse who I was looking for, she jumped out of her seat and she escorted me to a room in the bowels of the hospital called the family room. When I got to the family room, I saw all of my siblings. They were there crying. I have a brother who's six feet, five inches tall. He's the second oldest child. I had never seen him cry since he was a little boy, but everybody was crying. The room was heavy with emotion, and I knew that everything was not all right. But as the eldest child, I tried to keep it together. But the doctor walked in the room, and she said, family, I hate to inform you, but your mother is in a coma. I asked the doctor, could I go to see the woman who was not perfect but sacrificed for seven children? When I got to her room, I noticed that paramedics had cluttered clothing, clothing from her body. I tried to look in her eyes, but they were rolled to the back of her head. Her tongue was hanging out of the left side of her mouth. I could no longer contain my emotion. And I started to have a flashback about a woman who tried to do the very best that she could, but she fell short at times. I had a flashback of 
sometimes not knowing where our next meal was going to come from. I had a flashback about a mother who cried herself to sleep during Christmas because Christmas is so commercialized. It's about how many gifts you can buy your kids, and it's even worse today. I had a flashback. As I prayed to God to bring my mama out of that coma, but it did not happen. You see, sisters and brothers, my mother died at the young age of 42 years old. And I was 22. My baby sister was 12, there's seven of us. And not only did my mother die at 42, she died with her dreams deferred. Langston Hughes asked in his poem, what happens to a dream deferred? And she died on the system of welfare. You see, she needed that medical coverage. And she didn't have a life insurance policy. And she didn't have any money in the bank. I was a sophomore at a community college, trying to find my way, trying to become a cycle breaker, trying to defy the odds. There are many, many, many people in this country who can tell a similar story that they are trying to become cycle breakers, that they are trying to defy the odds, and yet in the wealthiest country on the face of the earth, we can't even get folks who are elected to office to do the right thing by the people in this country who work so hard each and every day. Everybody counts. Poverty shouldn't be a crime. So I want you to know, but many of you already know it, that we have sisters and brothers like that on the Republican side, the Green Party side, the Libertarian side, no side. And the reason why I want us to heed the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that we have to do this fight in love. But we're going to fight it, but we're going to do it in love. Because human suffering knows no political affiliation. And it pains me to see what is happening to us as a nation over the election of one person. We got to overcome that. And we got to resist the urge. Soft on people, hard on the issue. So every time you activists and professionals and advocates are fighting this fight, I want you to think about David and Amy. And I want you to think about my mother. And I want you to think about my siblings. And I know that my mother would be awfully proud because she never lived to see her eldest daughter do some pretty incredible things. But, It is by the grace of an almighty God that I fight and I will continue to fight. So three things, sisters and brothers, I want you to remember. Number one, I believe that the creator of this great universe has given us two hands, one to reach forward and one to reach back, lifting as we climb. We are our sisters and our brothers' keepers. Number two, and most importantly, we can't ask other folks to do more for us than we are willing to do for ourselves. We are doing this thing. The soul force. But in the words of my grandma, grandma was born in 1913. She couldn't read or write, but she could count her money. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, she carried that money in the Southern Ladies Bank and Trust. <laughs> VP Wade, you know what I'm talking about. Grandma had the gun on one side and the, and the money on the other, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> when I asked my grandmother, what does it take to be successful in life? She said, my dear granddaughter, all you need are three bones. I want to leave those three bones. Three bones, the wishbone, the jawbone, and the backbone. 
He said the wishbone will keep you hoping and praying because hope is the motivator, but the dream is the driver. She said the jawbone will give you courage to speak truth, the power to lift your voice. But she said the most important bone of them all the super casualistic, expialidocious bone is the backbone. Because the backbone will keep you standing through all of your trials and your tribulations. And in this life, sisters and brothers, we're going to go through some stuff, but we can't have a testimony without a test. So we are being tested whether or not we have courage enough, tenacity enough, perseverance enough, love enough, soul force enough to stand up and continue to fight this fight in the face of extreme opposition. We can do this. We will do this because we are fighting for something that is bigger than ourselves. And when the story is written, about the sole force of the Medicaid for all, Medicare for all movement, the sole force of the single payer movement. You're gonna be one of those that has no regrets about using your wishbone, your jawbone, and your backbone to do this thing because it must be done. And it cannot be done without you. So never give up. Never give in and never give out. We got this thing. God bless you. for one second for the fact that the clock went away. I mean, I don't know. There is no way on earth that any one of us, certainly not me, would ever miss an opportunity to see this woman, listen to her speak, and know that she speaks the truth. There is no way I would miss that. I'll stay up all night, and I'm old now. It would really be hard. So when she talks about the jawbone, the wish, the, read that sister, the wishbone, jawbone, and the backbone. I got issues with words, who knew? That is a real book, and I do ask you to please support this sister, you know, in getting the word out and getting her truth out. So, you know, we can always say that we had, did what we could do, like we do now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah.